All right, we're going to move on to our next speaker. This is Professor Isabel Heyman. She's a consultant in child and adolescent psychiatry and an honorary professor at the UCL Gosh Institute of Child Health in the UK. She's going to talk about mental health and hypothalamic hematomas, a lifespan approach. Welcome, Dr. Heyman. Thank you very much, um, Kathy. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me. So um, thank you again. Um, and thank you for the kind of introduction. I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's evening now in London, actually. The sun's just beginning to go down. <laughs> so um, I was actually li just listening to the last talk and my little um, cartoon at the bottom right-hand corner is, a, is a, from World Mental Health Week. Um, and it's actually got those jigsaw puzzle pieces. And I think what came out so well is that the emotional and behavioral aspects of hypothalamic hematoma still remain, you know, a huge puzzle and, and problem to us all. Um, and, you know, something that we really need to think about. So I'm going to talk for the next half an hour about some of the things that we know um, and also link a little bit to some other areas of neurological conditions and mental health in general, in terms of how I think it relates to hypothalamic hematoma, because it's such a rare condition, we need to be um, receptive and broad to, to other conditions. And I'm going to give you some examples from a pilot research study we've been doing about detecting and treating emotional and behavioral difficulties in children with complex epilepsies of a range of, of sorts, but actually including several children with um, HH who've been in this study. So this is just a, a slide to show you the, the extent of the problem really, which is that many, many young people live with a long-term health condition, 12% of which um, hypothalamic hematoma is just one rare example. And we know that just on its own, if you've got a long-term health problem, your chances of having emotional and behavioral issues are a lot greater. And, so that's our starting point, that just living with a, an illness is likely to make you more vulnerable. However, we've got additional issues with a brain illness, that if you've got a neurological illness that affects your central nervous system, we know that you're even more likely, in fact, up to seven times more likely to, to have a mental health problem. And the population rate's about 10%. So you, could, you can have a 60 or 70% chance if you've got a problem like HH of having significant emotional behavioral symptoms. So there's a lot of information on this summary slide and I'm not going to cover all of this today, but I don't think um, this audience um, needs to be told that very often, the psychiatric, the emotional behavioral problems can be the greatest problems for families. Absolutely not the only problem, but sometimes they've got so experience at coping with the seizures, coping with some of the um, other issues that in fact, the, um, the behavioral issues are top of the list. And as we've already said, um, looking specifically at the HH population, rates are around 50 or 60%. We also know that cognitive problems, including intellectual disability, is common. And sadly, in some individuals, it may be progressive. And then we have two main groups of um, mental health symptoms. The group that's called the externalizing behaviors, including attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, or even sometimes conduct disorder, aggression, and rage attacks may be particularly um, common in HH. But actually, we mustn't forget um, the almost equally common in some groups, particularly in girls, the, what we call the internalizing problems. And these include the common disorders like anxiety, fears and phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, mood disorders, including depression and, and bipolar. Again, I'm not going to run through this um, review in detail, but we were in the privileged position um, to work with um, 
patients and families at Great Ormond Street with HH over many years and to pull together um, a case series of 46 cases and our fellow um, Georgina uh, Corbett Bircher took the lead on this. And we looked at the rates of mental health problems in our own Great Ormond Street Hospital in London population compared with all of the literature that had been published to date, which was the systematic review. And what we showed is that 60% or more of hypothalamic hematoma cases will have a psychiatric comorbidity. So um, that was in line with the published literature. And as I said before, most of the problems were the common mental health issues that you see in all children. So it wasn't actually rare or unusual difficulties. It was that group of externalizing and internalizing conditions I've already mentioned. And just to put a little more detail on that, we looked at how our Great Ormond Street case series of 46 uh, children compared with the international literature. The, to the, only, the total published is only about 260 uh, individuals. And as you can see, um, you know, we were pretty similar. So in red is the GOSH rates uh, percentage and in blue is the published literature. So for internalizing ex external as a group, pretty equivalent and really all the way along. We had slightly lower rates of um, oppositional defiant, um, but um, we had slightly higher rates of, of rage. So why, why is this happening? Do we know the cause of emotional and behavioral problems in HH? So top of the list, of course, is direct brain behavior links related to the hypothalamus. And again, that came up in the last talk that you know, one would hope that if the brain and if, if the behavioral and emotional problems arise directly from that altered tissue in the hypothalamus, it, one would hope that removing it or ablating it could effectively fix those difficulties. But we know from both the surgical literature and from um, other literature that in general, there's not a neat one-to-one -one relationship between this. There are some children who have hugely enhanced and improved behavior following surgery. There's others in whom it makes little or no difference. Um, so this leads us to think that there may well be broader neurodevelopmental problems in the developing brain of children who have a hypothalamic um, hematoma, perhaps linked to some of the genes that we know are beginning to be implicated or to the wider network problems. There are some specific issues in relation to HH, of course, the epilepsy itself, which I, I sort of um, subsumed in this group of, of issues, but precocious puberty is an unusual uh, problem, which can in itself give rise to um, emotional and behavioral problems. And then going back to my first slide, of course, the whole issue of the psychosocial impact of a chronic illness may have some impact on the vulnerability of the child and family. We looked um, in our series whether we could unpick this, whether there were any what we call associations. So did any particular features in the child link with a greater likelihood of having a psychiatric comorbidity? And we found some relatively weak associations. So externalizing symptoms might tend to be more prevalent if epilepsy is severe and uncontrolled. Externalizing symptoms were increased in children who had increased intellectual disability, and they were also more common in boys than in girls. There was a weak link between precocious puberty and anxiety um, amongst the internalizing symptom group, but otherwise we didn't find any specific associations for risk for, um, for example, anxiety or depression. So, this is my busy slide um, of the conclusions from that uh, paper that um, our population at, at Great Ormond Street 
is pretty much in line with the case series literature, really showing that um, two thirds of cases have seizures, 60% will have a psychiatric comorbidity on average, about two thirds as well will have some sort of learning uh, disability and um, externalizing symptoms are present in about two thirds. The, in, the, in the young population we had, um, only about 30% had internalizing symptoms, but actually this rate has increased in adults with um, HH and becomes more prevalent in uh, girls and women. I've mentioned that precocious puberty may be a particular risk factor for anxiety um, and the particular link between epilepsy and cognitive problems and externalizing symptoms. Unfortunately, we didn't have the data to fully unpick psychosocial factors. Um, I can talk a little bit more about this later. But what did come across in our um, individual cases is that many, many families um, didn't have access to the psychiatric and psychological help that they needed in order to support these aspects of HA. So this made us really advocate that all children, because the rates are so high of psychiatric comorbidities, should have at least a clinical screen for difficulties, both with their learning, for the cognitive problems and for their mental health. And those that screen positive should have, you know, pretty urgent and adequate access to full psychiatric or neuropsychiatric evaluation. I haven't talked much about autism spectrum disorder, but this is also overrepresented in the hypothalamic hematoma population. And it often does predate the emergence of epilepsy. And again, this is an aspect which needs all the usual support that children on the autism spectrum need. And children should have access to all the ordinary treatments for these common disorders like ADHD, ODD, anxiety, depression, um, as they present like any other child. So in the next part of the talk, and I think you'll see why it's relevant to us today, I'm gonna to take a slight step sideways from the immediate issue of hypothalamic hematoma to talk about a trial we've been doing um, where I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Sophie Bennett, who's one of the lead researchers on mental health interventions for children with epilepsy. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our pilot study, because I think this is a model that would be extremely relevant to children attending epilepsy clinics, neurology clinics for their hypothalamic hematoma. So what we know from surveys in the UK, looking at the resources that children with complex epilepsy receive, is that as you would expect, almost all of them have um, a specialist pediatrician with expertise in epilepsy. And really the majority have got we, what we call in the UK, an epilepsy specialist nurse, and I'm sure you have um, equivalent um, healthcare professionals in the US. But really only a tiny proportion reported having the mental health provision that they needed. So just over uh, 10%, 12, 13%. So the emerging picture from surveying hundreds of parents in the UK showed us that neurological illnesses, um, which incorporated mental health comorbidities, really left children at a bit of a lurch with their condition, their mental health problems undiagnosed and undertreated. We don't know why this is. Maybe it's because everybody is focusing a great deal on the epilepsy, on the physical health problems. At least in the UK, um, sometimes mental health care is physically very separate from pediatric um, uh, neurology care, sometimes in different buildings, funded through different routes. And I still think that there's quite a substantial lack of understanding um, at nobody's fault, but because of the training that people receive um, of mental health problems within um, paediatric neurology and neurosurgical services. And this is a great shame because what everybody should know 
is that we have really effective treatments for the common childhood disorders. And there is some preliminary evidence which we've reviewed that actually these same treatments work just as well in children who have got a physical health problem. So people shouldn't be distracted or put off by the fact that, oh, the child's got epilepsy, no wonder they've got ADHD, or the child's really upset because of precocious puberty, so it's not surprising they've got anxiety. They still warrant an effective trial of treatment despite the physical health problems because all the evidence shows is that they receive benefit. So we set out really to see how we could increase access to mental health problems by trying to base mental health intervention in pediatric clinics. And we decided to use what we call a low intensity intervention by really teaching parents how to do some brief psychological, behavioral, cognitive behavioral interventions themselves with the help of a therapist, um, which is cheap, it's effective, it's easy to train people to do this, and it means very few clinic visits because we did this over the telephone and more recently over Zoom. So, um, and it's been validated in adults with physical illnesses. So again, we looked at um, the literature to make sure we weren't being over, over optimistic that these brief uh, little interventions were successful, but they are shown to be successful in children, even with quite severe long-term physical health problems. We used, we trained therapists to use a modular evidence-based treatment protocol. And I haven't got time to go into details today, but it's actually a US uh, manual, the modular approach to therapy for children with anxiety, depression, trauma, or conduct problems. And the modules were brief, maximum of 10 sessions, usually only 20, 30 minutes over the phone, either to the parent, or if it's an older teenager, perhaps with depression, to the young person themselves. We mailed, emailed problem sheets, um, information. Um, for example, this is a, a problem sheet for parents about one-to-one -one time um, for a child with ODD. We focused the treatment very much around specific goals that the parents and the young person brought to us. So just to give you a case example, um, this is a little boy who actually didn't have hypothalamic hematoma, but I'm sure he will be very familiar. He had another complex epilepsy. He also had um, intellectual disability and was quite impaired. He didn't have uh, language. He had marked behavioral problems. And the goals that the parents wanted to work on with us was that he could choose some food when given a couple of choices at a restaurant without a meltdown or temper tantrum, that he would be able to settle to sleep without parents in the room, and that he was able to spend some time in the same room as his sister without a great fight breaking out. So I'm sure those are the kind of practical aims that will be familiar to many of you. And these goals um, were worked on using the MATCH behavioral strategy module, which again, I haven't got time to, to go through, but those of you who've um, done positive parenting courses and that sort of thing, and, and actually all parents are familiar with these strategies, include special time, praise, rewards, effective instructions, and active ignoring. And this was delivered to the parents. So he's just one boy in these 34 first pilot cases who showed significant improvements on an emotional and behavioral measure, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. Actually, we got clearer sense of direction using the goal-based outcomes that I described to you before, which parents rate out of 10. And on average, we got really good um, gains in goals over treatment. We also, um, talking to parents, got really positive um, feedback about their experience of this program. Um, they said that they preferred this sort of intervention, it's practical, it's hands-on, direct response to what you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day level. Um, 
And this is not necessarily without effort. Parents, you know, reported that 10 sessions is, you know, a significant amount of commitment, but that it does work. Coming back to the rare epilepsies, and of course, this is very much the case for hypothalamic hamartoma. One of the things after our pilot that we talked a lot to our parents about was whether they felt the therapists they were working with understood enough about epilepsy. And we got really an encouraging message that they didn't feel that these um, psychological therapists needed to be experts in epilepsy, but they did need to understand what it was like living with a child with unpredictable epilepsy and associated unpredictable um, neurologically driven behavior. And we just, I put this quote up, you know, it's like walking on a frozen lake, waiting for it to crack. And I think that's, a, I'm sure that's a, a feeling that, that many of you are familiar with. So this led us to design the randomized controlled trial, which we're now carrying out to take this pilot method um, into a proper study. And what this comment from parents made us decide to do is to train epilepsy nurses to deliver the psychological therapy. And, you know, we were quite cautious about that. We didn't know whether they would be interested, whether they could do it. And I could do a whole presentation on the training. We ran a three-day training, training program with um, a manual, and they're very closely supervised. Um, but the therapists in the trial are absolutely loving learning how to do this work. Um, they feel it gives a real focus to their work in the epilepsy clinics when they can give a targeted mental health intervention. So, um, we know that these standard protocols can be applied to children with neurological problems. They may be models for other chronic illnesses outside the epilepsies, but certainly for hypothalamic hamartoma. So just my final um, two slides here, really. I've talked a lot about brain illness in general and complex epilepsies in general, but you know, hypothalamic hematoma is a very special, very complicated uh, condition, which raises particular challenges. And on this side of this chart, I've put some of these unique factors, which we know have a direct impact on behavioral and emotional disorders. So, you know, you've had a, a, a really fantastic initial talk about surgery and the anatomy. Um, we know that the impact of the, um, the hamartoma is, is almost inevitably epilepsy, not always. Sometimes um, endocrine abnormalities, including precocious puberty. And of course, a consequence of this is that many children are on a lot of um, anti-epileptic medications as well. We know that this constellation of problems not only can contribute directly to emotional and behavioral problems, but also to cognitive dysfunction and learning problems, and also to these, these more nuanced and indirect problems with self-esteem, coping with life, effects on personality, social interactions, um, friendship groups, ability to engage and impacts on the whole family. And, you know, these social factors become a whole group in themselves with impacts on school, um, interpersonal relations, on the home, on parental factors, even sometimes on, uh, we had several parents who, you know, reported big impacts on their own working lives because of the numbers of appointments um, for their children. Um, and, you know, the effects that environment can have on a child um, in, for example, special settings. Now, I don't want you to all um, get upset when I show my next slide, but it just I was thinking laterally when I was preparing this talk. And what I realized um, over the last year, as well as seeing several children with hypothalamic hamartoma, I had seen children 
with rare brain diseases who were linked into this whole range of charities. I had to trawl through my emails, my notes to pull this all out. But, you know, I've seen children with alternating hemiplegia of childhood. I'm not going to talk about this with tuberous sclerosis, with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, um, many children with brain tumors of, of other sorts, with pituitary problems, et cetera, with rare epilepsies like, like Drave. And, you know, what struck me is that all of these individual charities offer tremendous personalized, specific support for the group of young people and families with these specific problems. But also I was struck by how much so many of these children across conditions had in common. And I suppose the clinical story I just wanted to quickly tell um, is that we had hoped a couple of years ago to set up um, a behavioral intervention group for parents of children with hypothalamic hamartoma. But in fact, um, we couldn't get enough um, families together because of the rarity of the condition with children with the right issues of the right age. So instead, we ran the behavioral group, um, which was very much like the match protocol. It was a cognitive behavioral 10-session um, uh, parent group. We ran it with parents of children with a whole range of problems. Many of them had epilepsies, rare epilepsies, couple of children had brain tumors of other sorts. There was a child um, with tuberous sclerosis in there and there was one little boy um, with Duchenne's. And we've had fantastic um, preliminary outcomes from that group. So that just leads me to my final slide, which is to reiterate what I just said, that um, disorder specific support networks and charities um, provide unique support as does um, Hope for Hypothalamic Hamartoma, you know, perhaps more than any other charity I've worked with. Huge amounts of expertise and promotes understanding, discovery and research. But I also want to reiterate that many rare disorders share commonalities with others, especially in terms of emotional and behavioral needs, which tend to be common, quite generic um, conditions. And many children and families can be helped with common mental health problems by generic services, but actually um, they're often a bit daunted or even intimidated by rare conditions. So I think one of the things that we as specialist health professionals can do, and also the charities can do, is to help support your community child psychiatrists, your community psychologists, to understand that actually some of the issues that you might want help with, they may be very well equipped to deliver, but that actually you can provide a bit of specialist information and support about hypothalamic hamartoma to help with the, the collaboration and the relationship. And my final slide is to thank um, the psychological medicine a clinical team and research team and our funders and NIHR who are funding um, the MICE trial, the Mental Health and Children with Epilepsy trial moving forward. Thank you very much again for inviting me. Dr. Heyman, thank you so much for your presentation. As you are well aware, your topic is near and dear to many of our hearts. Uh, obviously seizure control is one, but for many families, even after seizure control has been achieved, it is indeed the behavior issues that affect uh, families' lives day to day and, and can be very challenging. And uh, the, many of the questions kind of center around what you discussed about behavior and what we might expect to see in kids and adults that have a long-term chronic illness, epileptic syndrome. But I think specifically, could you speak to the rage behavior that is a part of the hypothalamic hammer Thomas syndrome and specifically the, the feeling sometimes that, that families are told that behavior is due to poor parenting, bad home life, um, you know, uh, potentially many other um, responsible sources 
instead of the hypothalamic hematoma and a true rage kind of predatory type behavior. Yes. No, thank you. Um, that's a really uh, great question. So I, I think it's, it's a complicated question to answer because, you know, this group and I would be the first to say that the rage attacks almost certainly arise from the brain disorder itself. It is absolutely not a result of poor parenting, psychosocial factors. But that doesn't mean that those behaviors aren't amenable to a degree of change using some of the treatments that are used in all types of behavioral problem. And so I think that's the challenge for mental health professionals and psychologists is to not make parents feel that if they recommend, um, you know, learning strategies of super parenting. So this is not learning ordinary parenting. This is learning strategies that are above and beyond what you'd ever have to do with another child. And of course, sometimes it doesn't work. But I think the sense that a hypothalamic driven rage is somehow completely unmodifiable, is above and beyond what other temper tantrums or rages might be in another child, is absolutely not entirely correct. And I think that's done a disservice to kids with hypothalamic hematoma and their parents. So that's my plea, really, is, you know, I'm not saying that this is not a very special group. I'm not saying that the hypothalamus itself isn't intimately in, involved, but don't reject the ordinary parenting programs because having a parenting program doesn't mean you're a bad parent. Um, it may mean you just need to, you know, top up your skills, learn some extra techniques. Perfect. The other thing I would say, actually, Lisa, just to finish off, is that in my experience, ADHD gets underdiagnosed and undertreated in hypothalamic hematoma and in other epilepsies. And rage, impulsivity, you know, poor um, self-control, very labile, fluctuating mood, this sudden on-off, you know, behavior is very common. And so again, if you haven't had an evaluation for ADHD and your child has rage, I would really suggest um, thinking about that and even trying medications for ADHD just for rage itself, because it sometimes can be really helpful. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll do one more. It says, um, our child has been diagnosed with global developmental delay and is starting speech ther therapy and occupational therapy. He's three years old and isn't communicating much yet. Would a child psychologist still be able to help him? Thank you. Um, so I think he's getting the right um, treatment, um, having had, you know, a developmental assessment and starting some ordinary um, speech and language therapy and occupational therapies. I think um, unless there's an additional psychological problem, I don't think... I would be adding in additional child psychology help at the moment. But I think if as a result of, you know, your toddler's immaturity, which he will be if he's got global delay, for example, you've, you're having the terrible twos running on into the threes and the fours and the fives, then, you know, getting a bit of advice from a psychologist on how to manage persisting, you know, immature behavior when you would be hoping he was outgrowing it would be helpful because you need to think what a, a delayed three, four, five-year-old should be doing and could be doing and getting a little bit of reassurance and help around that. Perfect, thank you. One last one. Uh, the question is, applied behavioral therapy similar to the type of therapy you piloted and are teaching other groups about? How are they similar and how are they different? Um, so, I'm not an expert in applied behavioral um, therapy, but as I understand it, I think there's a lot of, of parallels. So, you know, both, both parent, parenting training, treatment for anxieties, other um, cognitive behaviorally based interventions 
do involve what we call a behavioral analysis, which is very core to um, applied behavioral therapy, which means, for example, if your child um, has a meltdown, to see if you can do what we call an ABC analysis, detect an antecedent, then see what the behavior is, and then see what the consequences in terms of how you respond, what you do, does it shape you up a lot? Are you able to ignore it or withdraw? So I think there are a lot of, a lot of parallels. Um, the key to all of these, you know, is to reward and enhance behaviors you want to see and to withdraw from and try to disengage, ignore unwanted behaviors. But of course, this is really easier said than done when you have you know, a rage attack in the middle of the supermarket with no apparent trigger, which is, of course, what one often hears in HH. There was no trigger. It was completely out of the blue. So, um, you know, in brief, this is a similar therapy, but, you know, there's always times when it doesn't fit well with your particular problem. I think we're about at the close of our time. Uh, Dr. Heyman, thank you so much. And we will follow up with you for future therapies and treatments as, as you have, are pioneering this, these treatments for HH specifically. We are very appreciative and we will keep our community abreast of those therapies. Thank That's you so fine. much for the invitation. Thank you.